Siraji has nothing special to say. A few local yogis and foreign yogis have practiced. And when they practice according to the instructions, then the virtue of the Dhamma, that it bears and elevates those who practice according to the Dhamma. This virtue becomes apparent. And to the extent that yogis practice, their life is, becomes elevated. And yogis also become related by the blood of the Dhamma. We become connected in this way through practice, becoming Dhamma relatives. Initially, Siyaraji was mentioned three types of relationship with, with the yogis as Asian relatives, as relatives, of, uh, world relatives, and as relatives in samsara. And so there are these three worldly ways of being related. For Westerners, just two the world being worldly relatives and samsaric relatives. If in addition to this, we become related by the blood of the Dhamma, then one understands what is truly uh, beneficial, what is truly to one's welfare. Each side has metta. So one, the benefit the people can experience from doing this retreat, from the practice, is the ability to uh, feel true loving kindness, true metta. And Seroji will speak a bit about this today. Seroji will speak about how the Buddha explained the word metta, metta. Uh, Sayadawji doesn't know how this word is explained uh, by people in other countries. He only knows the way it is explained in, by the Buddha. So he, it is explained to be a, an, a moist element uh, that wants others to be well, wants them to be happy and fulfilled in all ways. This is the element of metta, metta. And dosa, on the other hand, doesn't want others to be, to have benefit or to prosper. The mind that is connected with dosa, anger, is dry and brittle. And for such people, relationships with their family, with relatives, with friends, in these problems occur because there is this no, no moist element. So people are not able to stay together. They're not able to be united. But with metta, metta, it is easy to stay together. If you want to glue two pieces of paper together, you can put glue on one piece of paper and stick it to the other piece of paper. But the bond will not be very strong because the air can get in and make the glue dry so it doesn't stick very well. But if you put glue on each piece of paper and then put it together with some pressure, then these two pieces of paper can become like one sheet of paper. They stay together very well. The bond is good. So metta is first of all explained as sineha, this moist, sticky element. And, sorry, and with, with metta, it is, not the, it is not the stickiness the, uh, of craving and clinging. It is not a selfish uh, grabbing on and holding on uh, no matter what. Metta is what understands what is beneficial and to the uh, and prosperous 
for the other person and it involves relating in a suitable way. For humans to have mutual metta, uh, most people think of this as, well, wanting, wanting someone to be able to get an education, wanting someone to, their education to be complete, wanting them, their knowledge to become complete wanting a person to become fulfilled um, it, regarding having enough to wear, having enough clothing, housing, food, wanting people to be filled, fulfilled, wanting the other person to be fulfilled in this way. So in the world, people just think about metta in this way, wanting these types of conditions. But the Buddha said, that we have enemies both within and without. We have internal enemies and external enemies. Or and another way of looking at it is that we have enemies that are near to us and enemies that are far away. And metta wants uh, people to be free wants others to be free of these enemies. So internal enemies are the wanting, just wanting something, and then greed, for greed for something, and then extreme greed, where our greed leads to transgressive behavior. Metta wants others to be free of this greed. And then there's ordinary anger, just disliking, uh, dissatisfaction, moderate anger, and then extreme anger leading to acts of killing or harming, uh, envy and jealousy, and out of that, telling lies. And then uh, not having any knowledge about what is beneficial and not beneficial. And, therefore, and also not having knowledge about what is suitable and what is not. Without this knowledge, people do things that doesn't benefit them, that is not suitable, and thus gets into trouble. So metta wants uh, beings to have the type of knowledge that will help them. Uh, not to get into trouble. Metta wants beings to be happy and to, to have the happiness that is related to developing special knowledge. So the Buddha said that this is true metta. When one is about to do something or to say something or plan something, the knowledge, the ability to weigh whether what is about to do, say, or plan is beneficial or not is very important. This is, first of all, this knowledge is very important. And just as one would not like to experience unjust acts done to one, so too others don't like it this ability to put oneself in another person's place and to understand how they feel is of the nature of karuna, compassion. With metta and karuna, the wish for others' welfare, the wish for others not to suffer, on one hand, or with moral shame and moral dread on the other, then one will find it very easy to avoid doing uh, physical or verbal behavior that harms others. One will be, find it very easy to uh, keep one's mentality good and uh, not, not to harm others. So with, with metta, one won't want to cause others any harm. And also, with karuna, one doesn't want others to suffer. 
So to the extent that based on this, one avoids harming others, uh, they prosper, and one does too. So when metta and karuna that are infused with knowledge, that are together with knowledge, uh, then if people have this type of metta for others, for, you know, for each other, if this type of metta uh, together with karuna and knowledge is mutual, then nobody will be looking out, don't, nobody will want things just for their own benefit. There won't be this selfishness in relationships. Instead, relationships, meaningful relationships will arise, meaningful, uh, yeah, meaningful relationships. Those who have the knowledge like that to weigh what is suitable, what is beneficial and what is not beneficial, what is suitable and what is not, their ability to put themselves into another's position and understand how another would feel becomes very good. And one understands that one wouldn't like to be killed, one wouldn't like to have one's possessions stolen. And just as I don't like it, no one else does either. So when this feeling of understanding how other people feel becomes strong, then with regard to other living beings, one will have the desire for their welfare. Especially on a mental level, the wish to work for another's welfare will arise. Uh, But this can, not only mentally, but it can manifest physically and verbally as well. First of all, metta is wanting others to be happy and peaceful, wanting, wanting beings to be happy and peaceful, and especially wanting beings to be moral, to be able to keep the precepts so that they will be free of the inner enemies as well as dangers. So metta has the characteristic of wanting what is good for another, hitakara puvati lakana. So it is said, wanting what's good for another. This is the substance of metta. And when this is strong, then the feeling will become manifest in actions and speech. One will take the step of carrying out actions and speaking in a way that shows one's wish for others' welfare. So this is how metta, met, metta functions. It functions to bring about uh, what is to the welfare, what is for other people's welfare. So it is working to bring this about, wanting what's good for another and working to bring this about. Like that, when there is true, the true wish, not just pretending, but the true, uh, true metta on a physical, verbal, and mental level, then old resentments, not just ordinary anger, but grudges that have been held due to, um, due to things that didn't go right between two people or a group, Uh, resentment and bearing grudges, these things dissolve when there is this feeling of metta that is manifest physically, verbally, and mentally. And this means to say that old, old enemies become friends through metta. This is how metta manifests. When one has a mind, a mental attitude of metta, and when one carries out metta, not only mentally but physically and verbally, so that it is not pretend 
but true. If this uh, comes about, then resentments dissolve and people become true friends. Quarrels dissolve when anger subsides. So this true um, true and pure friendly feeling should be established. It should be cultivated and it should be developed. It's very good to have this. So for metta to become strong enough that it becomes manifest physically, verbally, and mentally, and so that quarrels and resentments die down. The closest cause for metta to arise is seeing what is good about another person. If we look at what is bad about another person, if we look at what we dislike, then we will just continue to hate. So it is said that the nearest cause for metta to arise is manapa bhava dasana padatana. So seeing the good side. So no one in the world is 100% good. And, and no one is all bad either. Sometimes what one does may be good, or what they say might be good, or their mental attitude might be good. Sometimes people are good in two ways, sometimes good in all three ways. But there should be one thing that one can find. Even if well, the actions one does aren't good, maybe what a person says, or maybe their mentality is good. So one has to try to find this good side of another person and not focus on the bad side. So there should be a strong enough good point to make one bring, uh, be able to develop the, the quality of metta. So this metta, it comes from seeing another's good side. So once, once one really can see how another person is good, then metta is sure to arise. Metta, and then from there, one will work, as the feeling of metta grows, one will work for another person's welfare. And uh, one will want the, their welfare, and then wanting another's welfare, one will act and speak in that way. And doing this, quarrels and resentments dissolve. So this is true metta, and uh, metta, as it's commonly thought of by most people, is really quite meaningless. When metta becomes strong enough to cause uh, hatred to subside, resentment that one had, then this metta is strong and patience comes together with metta. To the extent that there is patience, one will be able to forgive, to, to endure if one is harmed by others, and to forgive. So uh, one won't want to take out any revenge. So when uh, when anger subsides in one, then one doesn't carry out acts in order to harm others, no, no acts of cruelty. And when greed subsides, loba, then one won't turn to stealing other people's possessions. One won't turn to harming others sexually because of one's lust. And one won't, um, one won't lie for one's own benefit. And when one is without knowledge, then one would do things that are unbeneficial. And as a result, one would turn to harming others. 
but with knowledge uh, the, that is what is knowledge of what is beneficial and not beneficial, suitable and not suitable. Uh, this this important knowledge makes it very easy for one to have an attitude of metta. So with this, one's enemies, one's internal enemies of loba, dosa, and moha, they're all being put down. They're all being overcome. They're subsiding. And they aren't able to revolt again against one. So when there is, when one commits no actions to harm anybody else, because all this loba, dosa, moha has died down, then there are no dangers that come to one's doorstep. The danger, if one commits wrongs, harms others, then one will blame oneself. Others will blame one. One could be punished. And there's the danger of future lifetimes that are bad, because of the bad intention involved. But these dangers don't arise when one's internal enemies are quelled. So when we recite the phrase, Avera hon tu, the true meaning of this is may beings be free of the internal enemies and the dangers that arise due to them. If one practices, keeps the five precepts, that is the practice of humanity, the practice of the world, then if one, if these precepts are fulfilled, the internal enemy is quelled and therefore no dangers arise. So how will one feel At that time, one will feel happy and peaceful. To the extent that the five precepts are kept, the internal enemies are quelled, and dangers therefore don't arise, and one is happy and peaceful. This is better than the happiness that one gains through getting an education, being able to make a good living, uh, getting and having enough to uh, where to eat, a good place to live, and so on. This brings physical and mental well-being. So uh, this, this is what comes from having a, a mind of metta. And in addition, what else do we need to be happy? Well, we have to take care of ourselves in a daily way. We have to, when, we have to eat, and then we have to expel the waste. We have to bathe ourselves, we have to wash our clothes, we have to do all sorts of things just to maintain ourselves on a daily basis. So what we also wish when we want others' uh, welfare is that they be able to take care of themselves easily. So if one has um, a mind of wanting other people's welfare, then the internal enemies subside. So first of all, the, the characteristic of metta is that it, wa- it wants what is good for another. So that's the first line. So what Sayadawji just um, spoke about um, previously, the things that I didn't get to mention earlier, was that this is one of the most important tasks a person can do. Uh, because to have metta, it is something that we must do, we can't not do. And we have to do it ourselves. No one can do it for us. And doing so, we have to do it in time and on time. And when we do it like this, it brings great benefit, and the enemies are quelled. So we recite every day in Pali, Sabbe Sata. Avera hon tu. Truly, the meaning of this is that may, may they be, may all beings, be free of the internal and external enemies. 
that, that means to keep the five precepts. May all beings be able to keep the five precepts so that no fearful dangers will arise. And when this is done, we recite this in Pali every day, anika hontu, abhyabhaja hontu. That may, uh, because one keeps the, is able to keep the five precepts, then one gains physical well-being and mental well-being. And this is what we recite when we recite anika hontu, abhyabhaja hontu. And lastly, when we recite the Pali, uh, Sukhi Atanang Pariharantu, may all beings be able to take care of themselves happily and comfortably. So I don't have the equivalent of Sayadawji's Burmese verses. So if everybody just wants to recite the Pali with that in mind. Sayadawji said that today um, he has spoken about the characteristic of metta and how to develop it. This is not something that is just for Buddhists. Other religions too should have metta, should learn how to develop metta. People who have no religion also should have this attitude of metta because if one can't even have this much metta, then one is not truly human one should have enough metta to be able to keep the five precepts. So if one has uh, practiced and has gained some flavor of the Dhamma, then at this time one remembers those ones one, one loves. And one wants them too to experience the happiness of the Dhamma. One wants them too to be free of suffering to not get into trouble. So the roots of metta are this practice of satipatthana, when when we come to it through practice like this. And Sierauji hopes that you all may become people who are able to establish an individual world of peace for yourself, to make the world around you peaceful and to bring peace to the outer world at large. <laughs>